we're going to talk about a Fiat 500 case study now that we looked at some time ago. And it surrounds a misfire, um, which is well documented with this vehicle. It's the two cylinder twin air system. And you may already know what could cause that misfire. Um, we'll go through it together, um, how we try not to fall into the, uh, the trap of replacing parts based on known issues and use diagnosis to actually um, verify and qualify what is actually at fault. So here it is, the fuel efficient twin air two cylinder engine. And on the grand scheme of things, uh, fuel efficient small engines do have a place in, in the modern world in terms of um, emissions. When we compare the embedded emissions of a battery electric vehicle to a small fuel efficient engine that is used correctly over a longer period of time, it's actually a better option for the environment. And this is why diagnosis of such is so important because there is a place for these vehicles. So let's move on. Um, the actual fault description, the customer reported a severe vibration um, and the engine management light illuminated. Now this vibration, which turned out to be a misfire, was from cold. Um, certainly within the first 10 seconds you would notice and can you imagine a two cylinder engine with a misfire? So we're now down to one cylinder. It's not surprising we have such vibration. Um, of course, verifying the customer complaint is essential. And on this occasion, it's not always as easy as this. It performed right on cue when the engine was cold, started up and it would misfire and rattle. So uh, not too much uh, effort required to dig and delve into why or how this fault appears. So where do we start with diagnosis? The, the customer interview is essential. And I use this four targeted open question method. For example, how long has the problem been evident? And it, these do sound like obvious questions, but they reveal so much information, um, critical information about the fault that you're about to tackle. I say, how long has it been evident? Because if this has been evident since the customer owned the vehicle, it may actually not be a fault and it may be a characteristic. Not the case here though, this had been evident uh, periodically for three months. Um, when did you first notice the fault? Well, this was during the winter months, during the cold weather. Uh, this one is always an interesting one. We never seem to get the exact truth here. Um, has any work been carried out on the vehicle recently? Uh, on this occasion, the engine oil had been changed due to a low, ev low level oil warning light. And that rings alarm bells straight away because whenever a vehicle has been run low on oil, the potential for damage is huge. Um, I could not verify that fault on this vehicle, but nevertheless, it was a little golden nugget that may actually help us going forward. Um, I digged a bit deeper on this one and it turned out that the service history was not good on this vehicle. Um, it was three years between oil changes, even though they only drive around 3000 miles a year. Nevertheless, that is a long time. It's a long period to go without oil changes. And of course, short journeys, stop, start, they do not lend themselves well to keeping that oil um, uh, free of contaminants. Um, and when do you experience the problem? Of course, well, it was normally when the vehicle had been standing for long periods and always when cold. Okay, so the basic inspection, this one often gets overlooked as well. Just a walk around exercise, no tools required, just eyes, ears, uh, nose as well. If you can uh, often maybe smell burning or um, fuel, these kind of things, fumes, oil fumes, for example. Uh, on this occasion, no signs of damage, uh, connections, visible connections all look okay. We could never say a connection is fine, not until we actually intrude. Um, and of course, this, I call this a favorite discovery. It's a bit of a worry when this happens, but if a vehicle has had an accident repair and a poor accident repair, then alarm bells have to start ringing because the potential for intrusion or previous intrusion is high. Uh, so a fault code scan and I think there's a couple of standout fault codes here that we will focus on because they match the symptom. And that is uh, misfire detection cylinder one, temperature two high, another alarm bell there. Remember we had low oil level warning, which I haven't been able to prove. Um, temperature two high recorded by the scan tool. Misfire detection, so there's a misfire detection and then one aimed at cylinder one. 
And then this one here, inlet solenoid valve lift, valve control, cylinder one component sticking. Now that is quite a major component because remember this is a twin air that can actually vary how long and at what point the inlet valves open. It's quite a beautiful piece of engineering and um, yeah, it allows them to uh, have precise control over fueling, which comes back to what I mentioned earlier about low emission fuel efficient engines. So at that point, we've gathered quite a lot of information. Um, really, the most intrusion at this, this, this point in time is just the scan tool. Uh, it's worth checking for recalls and campaigns and bulletins that actually suit the symptom. Uh, and on this occasion, there was a bulletin, there's one here from uh, Diagnose Dan, that describes everything that the customer describes and that we've actually seen and experienced to the letter. Um, and ultimately, it asks you to replace the twin air actuator. And again, it's tempting to just dive in and do that. But what if it's wrong? Or what if we're wrong? Or what if we've overlooked something quite simple? It's going to be egg on face if we haven't got this right. So. Um, with that in mind, we'll move forward uh, and build um, at what we call a possible causes. So um, what could give us the symptoms? So let's have a look on the left side there. The ignition system is one, of course. Fuel system, another. We're looking at misfire or thinking about misfire. The engine lubrication system. I say that because how the inlet valves are operated electrohydraulically and the engine mechanical control system. So in other words, how the mechanical control system is controlled via the PCM. So let's form an action plan based on what we've gathered so far. Action plan is governed by accessibility and probability and cost. Okay, so we've got to be careful where we intrude and we want to be quite selective about where we're going to intrude and what's going to give us the best return on that intrusion. So we'll focus on engine management and we'll obtain multiple measurements from sensors and actuators during the initial cold start. Remember with this vehicle there's only a short period of time where we can capture the fault because once this vehicle has warmed the fault has cleared and we've got to let it cool right down again before we can re-attempt to get the fault. Uh, the choice here is the eight channel scope because we've got the the beauty of having eight inputs that we can measure. So we can be quite selective, but also grab key areas of the engine management system all in that one hit. So let's see. Prior to that, what about carrying out a recording? I thought about just doing a mobile phone recording of this engine starting up, and then I stopped myself and thought, no, hang on, what about an NVH recording? Because there we'll have engine speed, we'll have the startup. Um, a misfire, remember, will produce an E.5 engine order. One disturbance every two revolutions of the engine. So it's good evidence, and I like the fact that we can use MVH because we'll have the um, vibration and audio recording that we can keep for our own data, but also to show the customer as well. So just have a listen to this recording. This is the engine starting up from cold. Uh, and you'll notice straight away there is a clear misfire there. But also, E.5 engine order. Notice how high that is. Um, it's now starting to settle down. As we come down to idle speed, you see E.5 is dropping, and then we are at E1, which is our um, combustion order, and also our fundamental frequency of the engine. So we'll have a look a bit more detail. That's what I wanted to highlight, this E.5. Just look how high that is when the highest vibration order on an um, efficient running, uh, an engine, two-cylinder engine running without a fault should have been E1. It's E.5 and it is sky high there. So there is hard evidence that we have one disturbance every two revolutions of the engine which reinforces misfire accompanied with the audio recording as well. Okay, let's get stuck in there um, as non-intrusively as possible with the eight channel scope. I'll just explain what we have here. On channel A, we have the crankshaft position sensor. That will enable us to graph the engine speed. Um, channel B, exhaust gas pulsation. Um, we get capturing the pulsations in the exhaust system post-combustion. 
Remember, that can be quite tricky because um, the best way to analyze uh, pulsations in the exhaust system is when the engine is not running. So when it's cranking, uh, so engine turning over, but no combustion. Channel C is the inlet manifold using a WPS 500 pressure transducer so we can measure pulsations. Channel D is cylinder one inlet valve actuator and channel, channel E, sorry, is cylinder two. So these are the actuators responsible for operating the inlet valve. Channel F is the ignition coil for cylinder one. That's primary current. So I wanted to measure the current so I can confirm at least on the primary side that we appear to be uh, generating um, sufficient voltage based on the current flow for um, that to be collapsed and then induced into the secondary. And finally, I put on channel G the mass airflow sensor as well, just to see if that should yield anything. There may be something. Remember, we've already got a pressure transducer in the intake as well, but we've got eight channels. Why not use them? Let's have a look a bit more detail because we have captured an event here of concern. So let's focus on um, cylinder one twin air actuator current flow in yellow. That's channel D. Notice that during the on period, the intake pull on channel C, the green, is not as deep as what we see on the next pull. So let me see if I can just move my mouse in here so we can point. So here we have the inlet twin air actuator um, responsible for opening the inlet valve and the intake pull associated with that operation when the valve opens it is not as deep as when cylinder 2 actuator opens. Now look at um, channel F this is the current ramp of the ignition coil cylinder 1. Notice how when the vehicle fires when that cylinder fires how the crankshaft speed does not accelerate it continues to fall so at this point here in fact if, let's go into this area here where this ignition event takes place, we do not get an acceleration from cylinder one. Cylinder two, you can just see the remnants there of um, a field that's being captured by the current clamp around cylinder one. That is actually from cylinder two. At that point, we are seeing an acceleration. So what we can draw from this is that when the um, twin air actuator opens for cylinder one, we are not getting a sufficient pull of air into cylinder one. When the engine smooths out, I've actually changed these captures around now. So channel G now has the ignition event from cylinder two, the current in the primary in cylinder two. But once the engine had warmed, look how the pulsations have now smoothed out and look how after every ignition event, we have an acceleration in the crankshaft. So we've got even pulsations. So now inlet valve actuator for cylinder one is opening, we get in a decent pull and we get an acceleration in the cylinder. So this proves that at this stage, the misfire has cleared. Okay, so we've got to make a decision to go into further intrusion. Um, and let's recap. Cylinder one misfiring from cold. Cylinder one pulling insufficient air from the intake manifold. Cylinder one inlet valve actuator is drawing current. So we know that the PCM is trying to operate and that current flow has taken place. And cylinder one primary ignition current suggests that our primary control and windings are okay. So based on the above, I thought about which channel do we sacrifice. I don't think there was any need at this point in time to measure the secondary ignition event in cylinder one because that would not have an effect on the intake pull. In which case, why not go intrusive now and place a pressure transducer into cylinder one? Let's have a look a bit deeper. And I think this speaks for itself, doesn't it? You can see in the circle there that uh, cylinder one momentarily loses a compression. And if we look at the intake pull, so here is our inlet valve actuator current, we are not getting that deep pull on the intake manifold. And sure enough, as a result, 
if we can't pull air in, we will end up with a low compression. That's a one-off single misfire event that resulted in low compression. So our decision to go intrusive at this point was correct. So let's have a look at closer examination of this waveform. So this is that same event again. Look at the inlet valve actuator. The duration is shorter, which is interesting, but note that we still don't get a decent pull. We're not getting that suction being applied to the inlet manifold when the inlet valve actuator operates. Now look how deep the intake pocket is as well in our manifold, in our, sorry, in our in-cylinder measurement and how prolonged it is as well. It appears to have like a deep dish effect with no clear defined inlet valve open or close event. There is an event here that appears to, would suggest that maybe the valve partially opened because we do start to fall, uh, pull into a, um, a, a, a negative, a trough. We see that there is some form of activation or activity in the inlet manifold but it certainly doesn't transpire into a deep pull like we see on the other cylinders. Notice as we move along as well that the next inlet valve um, actuator open event, um, they've increased the duration, which may have been an attempt to compensate or recognition that the short duration didn't result in a full open. So the PCM trying to compensate, certainly on the next event, we can see a deeper intake pull. And as a result, a defined, uh, certainly um, a, an equal intake pocket to the expansion pocket and ultimately a superior compression. So based on all those previous measurements, we have enough evidence that our intake valve is not fully opening. I think we can agree there. Uh, we've established the cause of the misfire, but not why. Uh, we know that the inlet valve actuator uh, consumes current so that PCM control and the circuit for all intents and purposes is okay suggesting work is done by the actuator so what else could cause the inlet valve not to open when commanded by the PCM possible causes then mechanical sticking of the inlet valve so although the actuator is operating Maybe the inlet valve is sticking mechanically and it cannot overcome the sticking valve. It's a possible. Incorrect oil pressure. Um, we, need to be, we need to measure oil pressure, of course. Incorrect oil viscosity. Remember, it's electrohydraulic. That's why viscosity and oil pressure are so uh, essential. Engine oil contamination or restriction. Now, there was a fault code, wasn't there, for uh, high temperature but no loss of coolant. Maybe there could have been something uh, because of uh, oil starvation. Certainly no horrible knocking noises once the engine had warmed up. So I don't know, they, they, it's a kind of a conflict, isn't it, there? Um, it had had a recent oil filter change. Uh, an inspection of the inlet valve actuator inline filter confirmed no contamination. So I think we'll have to accept that oil supply to the inlet valve actuator assembly was okay. Okay or not okay, shall we measure? That's what we're going to do here. Let's have a look at oil pressure. We may as well, we've got nothing to lose. Uh, we can use the Rectus adapters for our WPS 500. Uh, and what we can do beyond that is measure oil pressure dynamically, uh, not just at a fixed engine speed, but also fixed load. And here we have it with this four channel capture and a math channel. We've got the crankshaft on channel A, which we can graph our engine speed. Um, channel B, inlet manifold pressure waveform. That's of no real interest at this point. Um, channel C is our oil pressure. So this is our WPS pressure transducer connected into the engine where the oil pressure switch would be located. Channel D is the temperature. So now we'll be able to plot the temperature across um, the entire warm-up period and just note changes in oil pressure relative to temperature and also engine speed. Just note here as well during wide open throttle how the oil pressure um, boosts. I think our maximum at there is 5.858 and that is instant response to wide open throttle. 
So what about a prolonged oil pressure test? And I know this sounds like overkill, but these are options at your disposal where there's doubt. And this is a road test covering 55 miles. So um, <laughs> again, it, it may sound like overkill, but just look at how the oil pressure changes over time. Uh, channel C is the gas pedal position. So we've got driver intention. We've got engine speed on channel A, and we've got the actual oil pressure on channel B, at which we can zoom in at any point during the road test and find out if our oil pressure ever dipped to a threatening level. Um, the lowest achieved was 1.1 uh, bar, so that's, that's good, that's acceptable. Um, notice where we did have oil pressure dropping to zero was where stop start was active. So this is me now sitting in traffic, engine has stopped, engine has cut, but pulling away uh, a great response from the oil pressure, the pump, uh, the, 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 the passages and the circuitry within inside, all good, all back up to full pressure. Basically, what I'm trying to summarise here is we don't have an oil pressure problem. So, uh, to summarise, uh, inlet valve for cylinder one failed to open fully, intermittently. The PCM control of the inlet valve actuator was correct with adequate flow, uh, with adequate current flow evidence. Uh, sorry, let me say that again, with adequate current flow evidence when the fault occurred. And that's what's important. We knew that the PCM tried to command the inlet valve actuator when the fault occurred. Engine oil quality and pressure was confirmed as correct. And the inlet valve actuator, twin air actuator, was therefore removed. And the inlet valves inspected for mechanical sticking and operation. And I can say that they were all OK. So this is me physically getting into the port now. Uh, also being able to press down on the top of the valve and see that the valve was smooth in operation and returning. Also a great opportunity to look at valve springs as well. Okay, so um, rectification and uh, verification more importantly. So after replacing the valve inlet valve actuator, the engine was reassembled uh, and ready for post fix measurement. And we'll analyze it closely here. Uh, main focus, just look at channel C. Uh, we've got even pulsations, we've got current draw into both actuators, and we've got even pulsations from the math channel, suggesting that we have no misfire. Or do we? This was one of those heart-in-mouth moments where, after I'd started this vehicle from cold, it misfired. And I was really concerned that I may have misdiagnosed, even after doing all this work. It transpires here that the misfire that you can see in the math channel here, whereby we momentarily don't get an acceleration after the ignition vent of number one, was down to a combination of things, either um, fuel priming, uh, maybe just the engine settling after it's been dismantled. How do I know that? Well, look at the event during the misfire. I know that the inlet valve was opening because my intake pulls are even. So it was not the same fault as before. And this was just a momentary, momentary event just after startup. So there lies um, a lesson in making sure that we still apply the measurement post fix so we get that verification. I was confident here that the misfire, the momentary misfire, and it was a one-off event, shortly after startup, after rebuilding this engine, uh, was purely down to either a fuel priming issue or engine just settling. So I hope that helps and takes you through um, exactly the, the, the procedure we followed with the Fiat 500 and how tempting it was to just fit this actuator for the inlet valves without doing any diagnosis. All right, I hope that helps.